The next topic that we discuss in this chapter are integrated rate laws. So we've now described two ways to calculate the rate of reaction. If I have a pretend reaction A converting into B, I can use my rate expression to calculate the rate of reaction with respect to reactant A, right? change in concentration over change in time. If I'm measuring rates at the exact same time, I can also use my rate law to calculate the rate of reaction. So again, I have two ways to calculate the rate of reaction. If I know that I have a first order reaction, then of course this is an exponent of one on A. For these equations, we, when we set these two equal to each other, we would integrate here. For Chem 152, we do not do integration. You're welcome to, for fun if you want to. However, I will give you the answer. So when we integrate, we get this mathematical equation. Realize that I can manipulate this equation to be equivalent in form to this one. And we'll mention this one on the next slide. This is the first equation that we reference that is on your equation sheet. So your course resources that are listed on Canvas, you have an equation sheet. This is your equation for a first order integrated rate law. With integrated rate laws, we are interested in studying how reactant concentration changes over time. And because if I just plot concentration over time, I don't get a meaningful graph. We want to modify it into a linear format. So notice this format gives me my linear equation. Notice we are still just using reactants. Because we've integrated from our rate law, which only uses reactants, we're still only using reactants. So A sub T is our final amount of reactant. It is after some time. The A sub 0 is our initial amount. And I have a note down here that units of concentration for A don't have to be concentration. We often use molarity, but we could use moles. We could use grams. We sometimes use percentages. As long as the units of your initial and final match, any units are allowed. One quick note here, when we do refer to the final amount, we're talking about how much reactant is still remaining. And that will become important when we get into our practice calculations. So in other words, it's measuring how much of my reactant is still present after some time. Our lowercase k in here is, of course, our rate constant from our rate law. And it does have units. Anytime we're working with a first order integrated rate law, the units of k are going to be inverse of time. And remember that that can be written equivalently as 1 over time. So it can be any unit of time, seconds, minutes, hours, days, etc. And lowercase t, of course, is going to be time. Key thing in here is to make sure that k and t are in the same unit. Make sure that they are either both seconds, both days, both minutes, whatever. If, if they're different, one has to be converted to the other in order for the units to cancel out. Now again, the reason that we integrate this is to give us a linear format so that we can calculate how much of a reactant is left after time or how long it takes a reactant to decay down to a certain amount. If we don't take this function of the ln of concentration, we don't get a linear plot. Remember that our trend for a reactant was that over time it will gradually decay. 
which makes it hard to come up with a mathematical equation to plot. And a math note for you as a reminder, when we take the natural log of a ratio, remember that this works out as subtraction. So we take the natural log of the numerator minus the natural log of the denominator. And that is how we can convert this equation into its linear format. <coughs> One other math note is we are often asked to calculate the final amount of something. So a quick note, if we solve this equation down to the ln of a sub t and we get this number, if I need to solve for my final concentration, remember that ln is a math function. We always have to do the inverse function to get rid of it. And so in this scenario, I would have to raise both sides to the e. A nifty note for you, you don't have to memorize this. If you take your calculator and find your ln button, realize that on the face of it, where the shift key would be, or how you would use the shift key, is the e function. So you never have to memorize the inverse, just use the shift of the ln to get your inverse. And so to solve this, raise 0.23 to the e, and then you get a sub t as a 1.3 value. So confirm that you can solve for that. And again, to illustrate the point of solving for integrated rate laws, going back to our concentration data for H2O2 decomposition, if I were to just plot concentrations versus time, I would see this downward trend, but notice that it's got a, a curve to it. It does not match a linear trend. But once I take the ln, the natural log of each value, I suddenly get this linear downward trend. And I can plot a linear equation for it and solve for various things in my equation from that linear trend. So again, the point of integrated rate laws is to determine what function of concentration will give me a linear trend line. The second thing that we can solve for for a first order reaction is a half-life equation. Realize that half-life is a measure of time and it's measuring how long it takes for the amount of a reactant to decrease by one half or by 50%. So if I start at 1.00, a half-life is measuring how long does it take to drop to 0.5. It's that same unit of time to drop to 0.25 etc, etc. We keep cutting our concentration in half. For first order half-lives, notice this unit of time is the same for every half-life. Every time my reactant has decreased by one half is the same unit of time. We can solve a half-life equation by plugging in values in our integrated rate law. 100 is our initial, 50 is our final, and we get this equation. So the T1 half is specifically denoting half-life. And this equation is commonly used when we talk about radioactive substances. Because their half-lives are often well known and measured, we can use a half-life to actually solve for a rate constant. The second set of equations we work with for integrated rate laws use second order, and we will only use first and second order for integrated rate laws. Realize for rate laws we have two options to get a second order reaction. We can have a single reactant that's second order, or we can have two first order reactants. It turns out that this option, the second one, is too complex, so we're only going to pretend that we have this scenario. So again, we can calculate the rate of reaction using both of these equations, and when we integrate, we get this version. This is also on your equation sheet. And realize that in our linear equation, it means that we've taken a, a different function of concentration to get a straight line. For first order, we had the natural log. For second order, we take the inverse of concentration to get a linear equation. And so notice here again, we have our second order integrated rate law. For another reaction, if I just plotted concentration versus time, we get this downward gradual slope. Once I take the inverse of every concentration value, that's what these black dots are, I get 
a perfectly straight upward sloping line. And notice I can tell it's upward sloping because my slope has a positive sign. We can also solve for the half-life, same definition. We do get a different equation that is also on your equation sheet. And notice that this one is dependent on our initial concentration. So notice our graph here, we have the same one on the previous slide. But what's unique here about half-life is the length of time is not constant. So our first half-life is about that long. Notice our second half-life is roughly double. And our third half-life is double again. So the half-life for a second order equation is not constant. It actually doubles in time for every half-life measurement. On this slide, I'm now going to summarize our equations that we have derived, just to put them all in one place for you. And again, recognize that this is the form that's on your equation sheet, but sometimes it is helpful to use the modified form of our linear version. And we have our half-life equation, 0.693 over k, over little k, this is our rate constant. For second order, the difference is that we use a different function of concentration to get a straight line. We take the inverse of concentration and we get a different half-life equation. So all of these equations are on your equation sheet, but it is important to recognize and remember the relationship. So anytime we're describing a first order reaction, we're using the natural log equation and this half-life. And this works vice versa. The next video we'll talk about examples of graphs and how we can use those to determine the order. A second order reaction will always use the inverse of concentration as our linear function.